Well, we're going to take a look uh, at the, uh, we're, we're going to continue on in the book of Acts. We're going to look at Paul, uh, who is still going by his Hebrew name, which is Saul. Uh, we're going to see the change in his life as a result of this encounter with Jesus, uh, this salvation experience on this road to Damascus that he's had. And now all of a sudden we're going to look at the transformational work that's taken place in his life. And really for us, what that means is that it gives us a glimpse and a picture of what happens when you surrender your life to Christ. Uh, it helps us in a couple different ways. One, it tracks our own development spiritually. So we could look at the life of Paul and we can say, okay, Paul has grown and we see this progression of growth in his relationship with God and uh, his understanding of the word. And then we can say, okay, there needs to be growth in my own life, in my own faith, in my relationship with God. Uh, and then the second thing that it helps us with uh, is that if you don't have a relationship with Christ, if you've not surrendered your life over to him, uh, then it gives you a glimpse and a picture of what will take place when you do. And, and I hope that you do, because it's a transformational work that takes place. Uh, probably one of the greatest pictures uh, and descriptions of what happens when someone has an encounter with Jesus and surrenders their life to Christ is in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Paul writes it this way. He says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, if anyone has surrendered their life over to Jesus, come to a place of complete surrender, then that person is a new creation. All of the old things have passed away. And behold, all things become new. In other words, there, when we come to faith in Christ, when we have surrendered our life to him, there should be a difference in our life. That the, the ways in which we went about life in the past, the ways the, that we viewed people and the world and our uh, families and our life were this way, and now, now that we have a relationship with Jesus, we've had this encounter with Christ, we are now new creations. Now, let me preface that by saying this, that salvation is not living your life the way that you have lived it and then sprinkle some church attendance and some serving on a dream team and giving in the mix. Uh, that's called religion. So there's religion that people will go from living their life the same way that they've always lived it and just sprinkle a little church attendance into it and feel like they're okay. But that's not what a transformational surrendering relationship with Jesus Christ looks like. When you come to faith in Jesus, there, you are a new creation. There are new realities. You should look different than what you looked like before that encounter. And we see these four realities in the life of Paul, and those are the things I want to touch on today in Acts chapter 9. The first is this, is that when you come to faith in Jesus, you get a whole new faith. Let me give you a glimpse into who Paul was before his conversion. He says in Acts chapter 22, verse 3, he says, I am a Jew born in Tarsus in Cilicia, but brought up in this city. Under Gamaliel, I was thoroughly trained in the law of our fathers and was just as zealous for God as any of you are today. What this means is that he not only had the Old Testament memorized word for word, but he understood the uh, rabbinic, uh, the rabbinic teaching, the, the teachings of the rabbis, and he understood the 613 laws that existed, the religious laws that existed. And he not, even, he, he not only understood them, he actually obeyed them. This is who Saul was. He was a religious zealot. He was somebody who had a zeal for the religion that he was a part of. Philippians chapter 3, he's telling the church in Philippi, he says, uh, I was circumcised on the eighth day. I was of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin. I was a Hebrew of Hebrews in regard to the law of Pharisees. He's saying, I was as Jewish as they come. I was like 
the Jews of all Jews. I was the, the, the religious leader of all religion, uh, uh, religiousness. Like he was the guy. He was the guy that while Stephen is being stoned, that these other religious leaders came to Saul and laid their coats at his feet, and he was that kind of leader that people followed him. They listened to him. They did what he asked them to do. He says, I am as as Jewish as they come, and as for zeal, I was persecuting the church. As for legalistic righteousness, faultless. If ever there was a question, I had legalistic righteousness nailed down. I was perfect at it. I was the top of my class. I was amazing in that. He says, I didn't tolerate anyone who didn't keep the rules. He says it this way to the Galatians, the church in Galatia. He says, You have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and how I tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many many Jews of my own age and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. I mean, he's, he's basically bragging that he was the guy that was the top of his class. He was excelling Uh, uh, well above any of the people his own age in the knowledge and the understanding of the rules of the law and the religion and his zeal for the traditions of his father. Acts chapter uh, 26 verse 9 says, I too was convinced that I ought to do all that was possible to oppose the name of Jesus of Nazareth. That's where he's at. This is a guy who knows all of the laws, all of the rules, has the Old Testament memorized. He's got the law memorized. He's making sure that people who even have a hint of following Jesus or proclaiming the name of Jesus are persecuted at best and at worst are killed. This is who Saul is. And Saul is walking on a road to Damascus. He's on his way. He has an encounter with God and everything changes, that the old has been done away, and now he is a new creation. It says in verse 20, at once he began to preach in the synagogues, not to oppose the name of Jesus, but now he's preaching in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. And that's what coming to Christ does. It changes our belief structure. Coming to Christ changes how you view life. How, coming to Christ changes what you value in life. It changes our priorities. It certainly changed his priorities, how he approached God. See, prior, prior to his conversion, Paul thought, if I just keep the rules... If I just obey the commands, if I just, uh, if I just live my life in such a way of, of strict obedience, then it would please God and that would be good enough to go to heaven. And after coming to Christ, he realized that no amount of rules, no amount of regulations, no amount of obedience would ever get him to heaven. See, before Christ, he thought that religion was just serving God. About a lot, uh, and about a lot of commands and words, lots of words. But after coming to Christ, he realized that while words have a place, they need to be accompanied with a demonstration of boldness and power to proclaim the gospel of Jesus. Before Christ, he was teaching that Jesus was a heretic. And after Christ, he's teaching that Jesus is the Son of God. If that's not transformation, I don't know what is. It changed his view of tradition. It changed his view of people. And my question for us this morning is, how has your salvation changed your life? How has coming to Christ changed you? Because if it hasn't changed you, could I just respectfully say, maybe you haven't surrendered fully to Christ. 
Because what I read in Scripture is this beautiful picture of when we come to a place of surrender and we encounter Christ in our life and we surrender our lives over to him, we are different people. And if you're not, then maybe there's something out of whack in your faith. Some people believe that if I'm just spiritual enough, if I just do enough good things, if I'm not as bad as most of the people that I know, like if they just believe that, people think that that is enough to get them to heaven. But throughout history, what we've seen is that there are a lot of things that people believe that just simply are not true. People believe a lot of things that will never get them to heaven. But a new faith in Christ, a a surrender and a relationship, becoming a new creation in Christ Jesus, what that does is it begins to make God's word the primary focus of our heart. And it has this effect. It leads us in guiding our decisions. That that having God's word as the primary focus of our heart, it begins to change the, the principles in our life. As we read it and we read the principles of Scripture, we begin to apply those scriptures or those principles into our life. And when we begin to apply those principles, we now no longer look the way that we used to look because now we're operating under a different set of principles and a different guideline. It changes how we respond to God. That when you have a new faith, you leave religious traditions behind. And I want to be careful when I say that because that's, that can sound like a Uh, a disparaging remark towards traditions. Not all traditions are bad. Uh, There's traditions that draw us closer into our relationship with God. There are traditions that we do today that have been instructed for us to do. We receive the elements of communion on a regular basis. You could say, well, that seems like a tradition, except for that tradition is instructed to us by God's word. To do this as often as we can. Uh, baptism, we could say, well, that's a great tradition that we have to baptize people in water, except for God's word says that we are to be saved and to be baptized. It gives us clear instructions to carry out this tradition. But there are some traditions that are not in Scripture that we've just come up with as humans, that, that we like. They're good traditions. They're not bad. They're not evil. They're just traditions that are man-made. And I would just argue that if those traditions become the primary thing in our life, then our, our order or our priorities are out of whack because our priorities should be, what does Scripture say about how we are to live our life? A new faith changes the way that we see people. You... What happens when we surrender our life to Jesus is the song that we just sang says is that we have eyes to see people the way that he sees them. And when that takes place, all of a sudden, the people that we used to despise in our life or those people that we would avoid, now all of a sudden there's compassion and there's grace. A new faith gives us a heart of compassion. See, what takes place when we start seeing people differently is in the case of Paul. Paul had this wrong understanding that religion and the faith that he believed in prior to his conversion was really that you could only only a select group of people held all of the power and all of the authority of the religion. And what takes place, what we see in this new faith that he's now experienced is that that faith is for everyone. That God's grace, 
God's forgiveness is available to everyone. And that every person is made in the image and the likeness of God. And that every person has worth, has value, can experience forgiveness, can experience dignity in their life. That now all of a sudden in a new creation, in an upside down kingdom, people are no longer pushed aside, but people are invited into that kingdom. A new faith changes everything and it changes how you view anything. The second thing that happens when you come to Christ is you have a new fight. See, Paul's old fight was arresting Christians. His old fight was persecuting Christians. It was killing Christians. This new fight is helping people to come to Christ. This new fight is bringing the very people or bringing people into a relationship with Jesus, the very people that he used to persecute. He went from being the persecutor of these people to now inviting these people to come in and to invite them into relationship with Jesus. Acts chapter 9, verse 22, yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Christ. You and I should be growing in our relationship with Christ. We should now value different things. And if you have no desire to know Christ, if you have no desire to grow in your understanding and relationship with him, then I would just argue that there might be something wrong with your faith. Because anytime you are in love with someone, you want to spend time with them. You want to get to know them better. You want to be in relationship with them. It's, it, there's this perspective that says if we are in love with Christ, if we are in Christ Jesus, that we would want to be in communion with him, in relationship with him. We would want to get to know him better. We would want to understand his word better. But you have to battle to do that. You have to battle the flesh that wants to keep you from doing that. You have to battle your schedule because we're busy people and it's hard to find the time. We are in a spiritual war that's going on in this world. And it's why Paul says in 1 Timothy 6.12 that we are to fight the good fight of the faith. We have to fight to grow in the Lord. We have to fight to be in his presence and to spend time with him. Coming to Christ is entering a fight of sorts. It's where we are battling to become the person that he's always intended for us to become. It's, we, have to, we have to fight to raise our kids to love God. And it seems like we have to fight more and more every single day. That we have to battle and we have to help them. It's, we can't just take our hands off and say, hey, good luck in the world. No, we, we fight, we contend and battle for our children. How many of you ever heard the phrase uh, to fight for your marriage? I know some of you heard that and thought it said fight in your marriage. Uh, that's not what it says. It says fight for your marriage. Yeah, they... You have to make time for your marriage. You have to find those moments. You have to, it's a battle. That the, anything that the enemy can do to bring division or destruction in your home, in your children, in your marriage, he's going to do it. And so we fight this spiritual battle, this spiritual war that we're in. And it's, it's the same in our relationship with Jesus. We fight against the world. We fight against our flesh, we fight against our schedules and we say, God, I want to press into more of you. Acts 9 23 says, After many days had gone by, the Jews conspired to kill him. And that's a little misleading that phrase, after many days have gone by. Because uh, we could say, Well, how many days? Is it a week? Is it two weeks? Is it a month? Two months? It's actually three years. That's a few many days, right? I mean, like, <laughs> Why not say a few years have gone by? 
Uh, no, uh, uh, many days, after many days to come. We know this because in Galatians chapter 1, in verse 15, it says, But when God, who set me apart from birth and called, called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son. And I'm just going to pause there. I didn't, t- I didn't say this in first service, but I just, just, I just want to point out that Paul, who had been a murderous person of Christians, his, he had blood on his hands, now in his new faith, in his new understanding of who God is and his grace, he looks back at his life and he says, but when God, who set me apart from birth. See, oftentimes people are like, well, I've done too much. I've, I've just, my life has been a mess. I've been, uh, you know, I've rejected him. I've been in disobedience. There's no way that God could use me now. And friends, I just want to encourage you. I'm going to touch on this at the end of the message, is that you have a plan and a purpose that was created for you at birth. And it's no different for Paul. God had set him apart from birth. He had called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles. I did not consult any man. So Paul is telling them, I didn't get the gospel from other people. I got it from God. Nor did I go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was. Before I was. But I went immediately into Arabia and later returned to Damascus. So just as a picture, as a visual, I should have had a map for you, but in the north was Damascus. So think about the Middle East. Here's the Mediterranean Sea. You've got Israel here. You've got Saudi Arabia down here and Egypt over here, and it's all backwards for you, but it looks right for me. (laughs) And and you've got Damascus in the north, and And so he's on the road to Damascus. He has this encounter with God. He's given a prophetic word. And for three years, he goes down to the south. And he goes to what some scholars believe, Mount Sinai, which was actually on the Arabian Peninsula and not on the Sinai Peninsula. And and he goes down there, and and he gets a full dose of the gospel. Uh, Some scholars believe that he... Uh, spent this time in reflection, in prayer, in receiving the revelations of the gospel uh, from the Lord. Some propose that he engaged in some missionary work. It wouldn't be surprising knowing the heart of Paul. Uh, the, this area, this Arabian area, is actually called the Nabatean Kingdom, and the capital of this would be familiar to you. Uh, the capital was Petra. Uh, which exists today. And so here, here's where Paul finds himself for three years just being in the presence of God and training in the desert. That there was more that Paul needed to know about Christ. And I just look at that as a reminder to us that we never arrive, that we never get to a place to where we know enough, <laughs> that we ought to be continually opening our Bibles and letting Jesus apply the words to our heart. Part of the preparation of ministry is time in Jesus' presence and understanding his work in our life. It goes on in verse 22 of chapter 9, Yet Saul grew more and more powerful, baffled, uh, and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Christ. After many days had gone by, the Jews conspired to kill him. He's gone to Arabia. He comes back, and now he's preaching. And the Jews are not happy about it. And when I say the Jews, I'm talking about the religious leaders, the people that he was a part of, the group that he was a part of, is now upset with Paul, who used to be who they knew as Saul, because now Paul is proclaiming Jesus is the Son of God, and these people are irritated to say the least. But Saul learned of their plan. Day and night, they kept close watch on the city gates in order to kill him. But his followers took him by night and lowered him in a basket through an opening in the wall. Which is just fine comical. Like I, Because I, I'm a visual guy. I like to picture things. That had to be a big basket. It just says it was a basket. It, 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 They put him in a basket and they lowered him down a wall. That's a big basket. Or that's a little man. 
And one of the two. And interestingly, the, only, the closest Paul I know is a little man. Uh, and so maybe that was him. I don't know. Maybe it's a, I don't, whatever. It doesn't matter. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 says this, In Damascus, the governor under King Aretas had the city of the Damascenes guarded in order to arrest me. But I was lowered in a basket from a window in the wall and slipped through his hands. You guys are never going to forget that. You're going to think, every time you read that, you're going to be like, that's a big basket. That's a big basket. After his conversion, Saul begins preaching in the synagogues. He's proclaiming Jesus as the Son of God. He demonstrated his boldness, his conviction in sharing the gospel message. And that's really what the book of Acts has been all about. That when we are baptized in the Holy Spirit, when we have a fresh infilling of the Holy Spirit, it's not for the benefit of having all of these spiritual gifts. Those are good things. They're not bad things. But the premise of the, of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the importance of it is about what? It's about boldness. It's about power. It's about proclaiming the gospel message to the world that's desperately looking for it. Now, with that comes spiritual gifts, comes discernment, comes words of knowledge, comes prophetic tongues and words and all of these things. Yes, those things come. But the point of the filling of the Holy Spirit is the power and the boldness. And Paul experienced this. I don't think it was probably a huge leap for Paul to be bold you know, there was Peter who was kind of this chicken. I mean, he was the guy that denied Jesus three times to a little girl. And, and so he was kind of uh, very uh, insecure and weak until he experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Paul, on the other hand, I have this picture that he was kind of one of those people that had no problem speaking his mind. Had no problem just telling you how it was. And, and so he did. But I do believe that through the power of the Holy Spirit, he was able to now speak boldly about who Jesus is. Paul is so committed that he doesn't care what happens to him. He doesn't care that his life can be threatened. In Acts chapter 17, verse 6, in the NIV, it says, these men who have caused trouble all over the world have now come here. In the New Living Translation, it says, they are here disturbing our city too. In the message paraphrase, it says, and they are attacking everything that we hold dear. These people were threatened by the message that Paul had for the people. Some people today will be threatened. In fact, I would argue a lot of people will be threatened by the gospel message of Jesus. The gospel says that there are things that are right and there are things that are wrong. And we live in a society and a culture where it's, the term is we live in a pluralistic culture where there is no right and wrong, that all paths lead to God, that it doesn't matter what religion you are or what faith that you have, that none of that really matters. And so when you begin to speak words and say things that, no, there actually is a right and there is a wrong, it offends people. The gospel says that not everybody's going to heaven the gospel says that some people are actually going to hell. And that what you do with Jesus and how you respond to him affects your eternity. That's what the gospel says. And I realize that that is offensive to some. And I say that because there are some that will say, well, you can't say that anymore. <laughs> and I would say, I didn't say it. God's word did. The Bible is clear that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The Bible is clear that says Jesus is the way, 
the truth, and the life, that no one comes to the Father except by him. Acts says there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we can be saved. But friends, we live in a pluralistic society that says, and, and we're being told, that there are so many ways to God. But that's not what the truth of God's word says. The truth of God's word says that there is only salvation in one name, and that name is Jesus Christ. Muhammad won't save you. Buddha won't save you. Krishna won't save you. Your own spirituality won't save you. The gospel of Jesus Christ is true. And when you say that, it irritates people. It hurts people's feelings. There are people that will say, well, what about my, my, my friends or my parents or my family? And, and, and what about them? Certainly God loves them. And the answer to that is absolutely God loves them. And he loves them so much that he's given them away in eternity. And that's through his son, Jesus Christ. If all roads lead to God, then what Jesus did on the cross was a waste of time and a waste of a good man. He gave his life so that we could have eternal life. And so when you hear things like, well, you know, there's this religion and that religion, and they're good people and all of that, and I, you say, well, they may be good people, but they may not be going to heaven. And what this does, a pluralistic culture, what this does, the, this kind of society, is it... Oh, man, I was going to use a word that probably isn't a great uh, explanation of this. I'll, I'll, just, I'll say it. Who cares, right? That what it does is it castrates us as, as Christians. It's, it keeps us from going out and talking to our parents or talking to our families. Why? It does that so that, uh, or it, it does that because we say, well, they're okay. They may not, they may not be on my team here at Lifehouse, but they're on another team and they're going to make it to God and I'll see them in eternity. And so we don't have to worry about it if we believe in a pluralistic society. But if we believe that Jesus is the only way, the only truth, and the only life, guess what? That lights a fire under us and we say, there's no way I want to get into eternity without my parents, without my friends. See, it moves us from this passivity and it moves us into a place of action that says, I am going to live this out in their life. Just a lighthearted message today. The third thing that we gain in an encounter with Christ is a new family. Galatians 1.18 says, Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to get acquainted with Peter and stayed with him for 15 days. So he was only with Peter for 15 days. Verse 26 says, When he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but go figure, they were all afraid of him, not believing that he really was a disciple. They're like, uh... I know it's, it's been three years, but I kind of have this recollection. I mean, I'm, I'm not that forgetful that I, I think you were the guy standing there that everybody put their cloaks down to while our friend Stephen was getting killed. I, 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 I kind of recollect that. You look really familiar. You, you look like that guy. And, and think about it in our context. Let's say that someone murders somebody in our family, in our church. And then three years later, because for whatever reason, they get saved and they come and they want to be a part of our faith community. How, how do we respond? I know how I respond. Hey, safety team, you might want to keep an eye on that guy. Like, this is a guy that killed one of us, and I don't know if I feel comfortable being here in the room with the guy who just killed one of my friends three years ago. And this is their response. And, and so they, they're left. They're like, I, I, like, okay, we know that God can do a transformational work. We just don't know if he can do that much of a transformational work. And so he wants to come in and be a part of their family, and they they really reject him. 
But there was one guy that actually believed it. This is one of the greatest guys in Scripture. His name's Barnabas. We've talked about him before. He was the guy that brought a piece of property in, and he was loved and, and, and well uh, thought of in the church, in, in the faith community. And Barnabas, it says in verse 27, took him, brought him to the disciples. He told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly or boldly in the name of Jesus. So how does Barnabas know that? He knows it because Barnabas was willing to take a risk on Paul. He was willing to listen to him. And if Barnabas doesn't reach out to the person that no one wants to reach out with uh, or reach out to, Paul's life looks very different. His influence is, is very minimized. But this is a guy that was willing to risk and take a chance and to put his reputation on the line in order for people to experience the transformational work that God had done in Paul. Who are you willing to take a chance on in your life? Who are you willing to take a chance on in order for them to become a part of the body of Christ? There's, there's a, a video out there of, uh, of a pastor baptizing, um, baptizing a guy. And he's this big guy, and he's, he holds the microphone up to him, and, and he says... Tell us why you're being baptized today. And he said, yeah, sure, because I was a piece of... And he says it. And, and everybody, the, oh, there's another pastor behind him. He's like, what did he just say? Like, you know, like, that's the guy I want to take a chance on because there's a transformational work that's taking place in his life. Does he say everything the right way? No. Does it... Like, does he have the Christianese answer? Absolutely not. But that's the process of our faith, of our sanctification. That if we have to be perfect at the point of salvation, then none of us are saved. So Barnabas takes a chance on this murdering, uh, this murderer of Christians, this guy who's got blood on their hands, who killed their best friend, and says, it's okay. He's a good guy now. He'll be all right. I know that fellowship makes a difference and it would be great to have him as a part of our fellowship. Not just for our sake, but for his. Verse 28 says, So Saul stayed with them, moved about freely in Jerusalem. Again, here's that word, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. He talked and debated with the Grecian Jews. And again, they tried to kill him. So within 15 days, there are are people in two different cities that they just want him dead. And he understood that if God could change him, he could change anybody. That no one was too far off. And so he continued to speak boldly. The acceptance of Saul by the apostles shows the power of grace and forgiveness. The acceptance of the disciples reminds us of the importance of extending love and acceptance to those who have a genuine transformation in Christ, even if they have a troubled past, even if they were someone who we thought were too far gone, there is grace, there's forgiveness, and there's acceptance. Why? Because if God can transform a murderer of Christians and have a heart change and a transformational work that's so dramatic and so drastic, he can change anyone. Which brings us to number four, that when we encounter Jesus, we have a new future. In verse 30 and 31, it says, When the brothers learned of this, they took him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace. I wonder what that felt like, just a time where they just, they didn't have to worry about the persecution. They didn't have to worry about being in prison. They just had a time of peace. In verse 31, it says um, uh, they had a time of peace. It was strengthened and encouraged by the Holy Spirit. And the church grew in numbers, living in the fear of the Lord. So it appears that 
Paul spends some time in the town that he grew up in. He goes to this town and he spends where his father was a tent maker and he spends a significant amount of time there growing and learning. And I believe it's because God is preparing Paul for the big things of his life. It's not that we haven't seen some transformation in his life already, but there was a prophetic word given to him by Ananias that was that he was going to do amazing things. And if you're not careful, you could read into this a little bit and say maybe in Paul's case, that could have felt a little bit of a defeat. It's like, wait a minute, I'm supposed to do great and mighty things, and here I am now back in my hometown, and i got to preach to these people. Where's the accolades? Where's the notoriety? Where's all of this that I'm supposed to be about? And maybe it's because God is preparing him for those things. Paul needs practical time. He needs practical preparation that everything Paul knew about his previous religion has changed. All of the rules, all of the regulations, all of the structure that he once believed has now flipped upside down because the kingdom he's now a part of is a simple kingdom. It is an upside down kingdom. It's a kingdom that makes no sense to the world but makes sense to those who have encountered it. And Paul needed some time to have his mind (laughs) reprogrammed from from a structural system, a hierarchical system, a legalistic rules and laws and obedience to a system of grace and forgiveness and humility to a system that says the first shall be last and the last shall be first, to a system that says it's not about the power of your title or authority, but what has God done in your life and the power of the Holy Spirit to work through you. That takes some time to reprogram and to understand and to grab hold of. We can say it's a simple kingdom, but it's a kingdom that doesn't make any common sense in our humanity. What Jesus called a treasure, the world calls a curse, is one of the lines from that song that we sang. The small become great, the last become first. See, this is what the kingdom of God looks like. Now, unfortunately, we have a system and a structure set up in our country and our really across the globe where we have made God's kingdom, not about the last being first, but about notoriety, celebrity, the people who are on stage, the people who have the eloquent words, the people who, who are like this and that, and, and it's become something that it never was intended to be. See, what happens now is there's not a ton of people uh, clamoring to be in vocational ministry, but those who have felt the calling of God, and I do believe that it is a calling of God to go into vocational ministry, that when they've experienced that, what we set up for them is this picture that is never what it was intended to be. That you get to be platformed, you get to be loved, you get, you get to be uh, uh, put on a pedestal and, and on social media and all of these things that the world has perverted in our church. And maybe what people need is a season of practical transformation of preparation of what God is doing in the heart before you get into the ministry. Now, I'm a product of the church. I grew up in the church. My parents were pastors. I grew up believing I owned the church. I treated the building as though it was my home. I, I was that kid. I was that pastor's kid. I, got in, I, went in, I went to Christian high school, or elementary school, middle school, and high school. Uh, that only perpetuated this notion that I had it all figured out, obviously. 
And what it did is it created a, a, a certain amount of pride in my life, of religious arrogance and pride that said, of course I've got what, all the answers for people. I'm going to go into the ministry so I could give everybody all the answers. And then I got into Bible college, and it turns out there's people there that will put you in your place. And so it began a season. Had I gone into the ministry, in vocational ministry, right out of high school, I'd have messed some people up. Luckily, I went to Bible college. They messed me up a little bit. And then I, I, I went into youth ministry and just messed up some kids a little bit, uh, some students. And no, there was a process of God humbling me. And then I came here, and, and by the time I got here, God had done a lot of humiliating, a lot of humbling in my life. But I still showed up here. The previous pastor is a good friend of ours, has been here, was the founding pastor of our church. He was old enough, however, to be my dad. And so I came here thinking, oh, they've been wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. I'm here to lead them into the promised land. You're welcome. <laughs> so I was going to be Joshua to their Moses, and here I come. I now have all the answers. I'm 30 years old, and I remember distinctly when everyone was leaving the church, I just remember distinctively hearing God say, if I asked you to lead these people through the wilderness for 40 years, would you do it? And I said, absolutely not. That's not what I signed up for. No. That, I said, of course. If that's... I don't like it, but if that's what you're calling me to, then I'll do it. And from that point, everything changed. But there's a humbling that has to take place. And I have to believe Paul, who was so arrogant in his religious zeal, so prideful in everything about his life, I have to believe that, that there was this season where God wanted to prepare Paul for the ministry that he had for them. And nothing will prepare you more than going back to your hometown where everybody knew who you once were and now proclaiming something that is the opposite of that. Paul began to plant churches, and we know that there were churches that came out of, there were people that came out of those churches that were a part of the council and all of that. I give you all of this because there is a certain level of expectation. If God's given you, he's placed something in your heart of, of ministry, of purpose, of a plan, and you're not experiencing that, it can feel frustrating. You see, like, I, I know that God told me this, and why don't I get to do it? Why don't I have the opportunity? Why doesn't Pastor Ryan have me preach on Sunday mornings and this and that? And, and I just want to encourage you, and it's easy for me to say now, but it certainly wouldn't have been easier back in my 30s, is that maybe this is a season of preparation. Don't diminish this season of your life because God is doing something in you. And maybe it feels like you're not doing anything, but God is actually doing everything that you need. One of the goals that we have as a church is to start a ministry residency program. We have four interns that are going to be with us just here in a couple of weeks. They're just going to start their internship who are people who are interested in, uh, in, in ministry and missions and just different aspects of the church and and so they're going to come and be a part of this. And that's kind of step one. It's phase one of a bigger project that we want to do with a ministry residency. Because I believe that every person needs a safe place to be prepared, to understand, and grow in these elements of what it means to be about in, in ministry, in leading people in the simple kingdom. Not in the kingdom that we're trying to build to get people to us, but in the simple kingdom of humility and where the, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. That, that if we could create an environment, an opportunity that's here for that, it will save them a lot of heartache in their future. And so this, this is all a part of that. 
In verse 15, we see the prophetic word. The Lord said to Ananias, go, this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. But here Paul is in his hometown. He's not talking to kings. He, he's just, he's doing the work. Nobody notices him. He's an anonymous. But he's doing the work and he's being prepared to be able to go before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel and to proclaim the gospel message of Jesus. I believe God is at work in your life. I believe God is preparing you for what he has for you, what he began in you from the time of your birth. God has a plan in the future. We see that in Jeremiah 29, 11. When God, open, when God opens a door, no one can shut it. He remembers the prophecy. And when it, come, when it seems like God is doing nothing, God is actually doing everything in his life and he's getting him prepared and ready. I use this example in first service that we all are created with a purpose. We are created on purpose for a purpose. And for some, because you're happy with your life and things seem to be going pretty well, you're not sure that you need a relationship with Christ. And can I tell you that unless you have a relationship with Christ, you will never be fulfilled in this life. You will never discover your true intended purpose. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are God's workmanship. We are created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. Praise God for what you feel gifted to do. This may be a season where you are supposed to just get into the presence of God. Praise God for those of you who are wanting to step out and do more for his simple kingdom. Do it. I... I, was th I used this example in, in first service with, with Kelly. It, I believe that God has had a plan and a purpose in her life from the very beginning. I think Kelly is gifted in worship and leading people in worship. She's not the most talented uh, musician in the world. She can kind of tinker around on a keyboard. But there's something in her that God has placed in her in leading other people in worship. But if you would have told me in 2000, when we, when really in 1998, we got married in 1998, we're going into 25 years this, this year of marriage, and yeah, right, that's pretty good. Um, and if you would have told me that she would be on the platform someday leading worship, I would have said, you're out of your mind. Like maybe in heaven sometime, but, but not on earth. Uh, and it's, it's not because she wasn't good enough. It was because she was too insecure. She was shy. She was quiet. If somebody said, hey, you're going to be on stage talking to people, to me, most people would have been like, yeah, because you kind of fool yourself and you would be on stage talking to people. But not, they wouldn't say that about my wife. They would say, not Kelly. She's not going to be on stage in front of people. But I want to tell you that God is developing in her the purpose and the plan that he had for her from the very beginning. There was just a season of her life that God was preparing in her, working in her, dealing with insecurities, dealing with shyness, dealing with all of the stuff that we get caught up in. And now she's in a place to where she gets to lead a room full of people into worship, not because of who she is, but because of who God is. That, that's the kind of of preparation I'm talking about that maybe God is doing in your life, but don't give up on the plan or the purpose. Don't give up on it. Continue to pursue it and allow him to do it on his terms, not on yours. 1 Corinthians 2, and I'll close with this, says this, however, as it is written, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. Do you love your God? Do you love him? Because if you do, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for you. 
But God has revealed it to us by his spirit. That's not talking about heaven. That's like, hey, someday when we get to heaven, no. It is true of heaven, but what it's talking about is this simple kingdom here on earth. That when we faithfully live out our faith, the church can experience growth and encouragement. It encourages us to seek guidance and empowerment of the Holy Spirit in our lives and to participate actively in strengthening the simple kingdom of God. And a boldness and a power, not by our own authority, but because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's pray.